All right. So today, hopefully, we can finish our unit on curve sketching. Uh, and if we can do so, uh, then that'll mean that next Tuesday, which will be our last official lecture, uh, official in the sense that we cover new things, uh, then we can talk about optimization a little bit, which will be good because whether or not I talk about it in lecture, I will put a problem on the exam. I like the faces when I do that. All right, so uh, we've spent all of last week doing this, right? So we probably are used to this expression that I've been putting on the board. I said, what's what is it? Uh, first, what? First, a critical test. Then a cavity. Then a cavity. And what did the then a cavity have to do with? Time cavity. cavity, right? Which we haven't, you know, gone through completely yet. And then the last thing is then a second test. Okay. Now at the end of the day. I'm going to change this sentence up just a little bit on you, okay, to make it uh, applicable in more situations, okay, or at least a little more descriptive of how you should do things in general. Okay, but this is a good first approximation. Let's leave it like this. Okay, and so let's just quickly review, right? D stood for domain, I for the x and y intercepts, S for symmetry, so you're looking for odd and even functions, A, you're looking for asymptotes. Horizontal asymptotes, vertical asymptotes, right? ID was for what? Increasing, decreasing, right? And what did we use to determine whether the graph was increasing or decreasing? Sign graph. The sign graph, which we got of the what? Derivative. Of the derivative, right? And when the derivative was positive, the graph was? Increasing. Increasing. And when the, graph, when the derivative was negative, then the graph is? Decreasing. Decreasing, okay? Okay, then? Okay. First, a critical test. So we find the critical numbers. Okay. The critical numbers were where the derivative was zero or or did not exist. But there's a little caveat there. Okay, it doesn't exist. The derivative doesn't exist. But those points are in domain. the domain of the original function. Okay. So we almost got into trouble last time because we added some critical points that you should. But even those points which aren't in the domain of the original function. Those are always good to think about anyway. Okay. The reason why you look at those critical points is because those are the only possible places you can get what? Not vertical asymptotes. Where can, why are these critical numbers, right? Where the derivative would be zero, for instance. You can get yeah. max and min. You can get local maxes and local mins. Okay, and these are the only places you can get them, is at critical points. Either where the derivative is zero, or the derivative doesn't exist, but it's still a point in the domain of the original function. So then we moved at the end of last time to concavity. Okay? And let's remember what concavity is to do with. So all right, if you have a curve, and you look at the tangent lines to that curve, at least on some interval, and if those tangents lie above the curve, then we say that the curve is concave what? Down. Down, right? Like a frown. Concave down like a frown. Okay. So this is concave down. Okay. On the other hand, if you draw the tangent lines on some interval, and those tangent lines lie below the curve, right? so the curve is above the tangent line, okay, then we call it concave up, right? up like a cup. Okay, so if we want to know how we actually decide whether a curve is concave up or concave down, we're going to use the concavity test. The concavity test says the following.
if the second derivative of the function is positive for all x in some interval i. Okay, so i here is some interval. Then f is concave up on i. Okay, now why should this be true? The slope of the slope is positive. Hmm. Okay. What do we mean by that? So, if you take the derivative of the derivative, all right, then you're getting the slope of the tangent line to the derivative. So this is probably what you're meaning by slope of the slope, yeah? Okay. So this is saying that the derivative of the derivative is, in, is, is positive, which means the derivative is increasing, right? So if this was a, a question of position, velocity, and acceleration, then you're saying if the acceleration is positive, then the velocity is increasing. And so if the velocity is increasing, then you're probably thinking, ah, oh, my, my, I must be going faster. I must be going faster. Oh. Is it clear why, uh, why the curve has to actually lie above the tangent line, though? Find concavity that way because as far as lying above or below a tangent line. Because if it's below, then it's deep. Or yeah, what happens if you, if it's below a tangent line and you move to the right, then what has to be, what's happening to the slope of the tangent lines as you move this point? Yeah, these slopes are decreasing. If I go over here, here the slope is very positive. I move up, the slope becomes less positive, right? And over here, the slope is even less positive, right? So the derivative is changing, right? Going from something big to something small. Okay, whereas down here, what's happening? In, what's happening to the slopes as I move to the right? Yeah, they're getting bigger. And here it's very, very small. Here it gets bigger. And here it gets really, really big. Right? So the slopes are increasing. The slopes, of course, are given by the derivative. So the derivative must be increasing. And by the ID test, right, you say if the second derivative is positive, then the first derivative is increasing, right? which means you must be in this concave up situation. And well, the other half of this picture shows the other side of the concavity test, which is if the second derivative is negative for all x in some interval, then f is concave down. So this is you know a very simple test to use. Uh, it's going to work exactly like the ID test, right? I mean, you think ID test and concavity test, you're doing the exact same thing. With a concavity test, you took a derivative, right, and then you saw where it was positive, where it was negative. Okay? Concavity test, you take just a second derivative, and you see where it's positive, where it's negative. And both cases are going to tell you something about the shape of the original graph. Okay, whether it's increasing, or whether it's concave up, or concave down, or decreasing, whatever. Okay? And so you're going to apply the same sort of techniques Formally, right, you're going to, okay, take your derivative, then you're going to draw out a nice sine graph, you're going to figure out where this thing is zero, okay, and then plug in where it's plus and minus. Uh, so we'll do an example of this in just a second, but I want to just finally state the second derivative test, which we're not going to use a whole lot. It's an option, something that you can use in situations, 
but it's going to turn out that it's not going to give you anything new, usually. Uh, all it is is going to be a replacement for the first derivative test. Right. So remember, what did the first derivative test tell us? It told you max and mins, right? How did it do it? It said if you're going from a positive derivative to a negative derivative, then what do you have? Right? Positive to negative. You have a max, right? Or if you have a negative derivative and you go to a positive, okay, then you must have had a local min. The second derivative is going to make it so you don't actually have to test what's happening on either side of the point. Right? You can just look at the derivative at the point and the second derivative at the point. So here's called the f prime prime test. It's normally called the second derivative test. And you guys can actually figure this out for yourselves. I'll give you the hypotheses, and then we can work out the conclusion. So let's assume that the derivative at some point c is 0. Okay. So we have a chance at having what? We don't know what point of inflection is. A max or a min, right? If the derivative is zero, that means you have a critical point, right? And critical numbers are exactly where you can have local max and mins. Okay. So the question is, what do you have? Well, if you use the first derivative test, you have to look on the left and you have to look on the right and see if it goes from plus to minus or minus to plus, right? Or of course, it could do neither. So if the derivative is zero. And the second derivative is positive. Okay, so the second derivative is positive. Then what? Well, let's think. What kind of information would you like? And the derivative is zero. So it either looks like this or like this. Yeah? Not so many options. Okay. Or what, what's another option? It could be a flat line, right? Something like that. Okay. You might take all right, this could be uh, minus x squared, this could be x squared, and this could be, well, what well, maybe this is? x cubed, right? X cubed. Okay, so these cases, these cases can happen. Okay. Uh, so in this case, you have a local, is that a max or a min? I guess it's a max. A max, okay. And what's the concavity at that point? Um. Okay. The derivative would be negative there. And what about over here, right? Here you have the derivative is zero and it's concave up. Okay. So that's exactly the situation you're in. Okay, where the second derivative is positive and you're getting a local min. And let's look at this last case. What's the concavity in this point? Let's see, on the left, it's, it's clearly negative, right? The, the con I mean, the concavity is down. And on the right, the concavity is up. But at that point, we don't know what that is. Okay. Well, let's see. If f is x cubed, then the derivative is 3x squared. And then the second derivative is 6x 
And so when we plug in x equals 0, which is where that point should be, second derivative is exactly 0. Right. So it's neither concave up nor concave down at that point. Okay, okay so if we look at these three points, we can classify. So this is a local max. And the derivative, the, the second derivative is negative at that point, right? Because it's concave down. And here, it's a local min. And the second derivative is positive, right? Because it's concave up. And here, we have nothing, at least nothing we've defined so far. And f double prime is 0. So this answers our question, because these are really the, the three cases that we can get. Either the second derivative is 0, in which case we, we just can't say anything. Right? Or the second derivative is negative, in which case you have a local max. Or the second derivative is positive, in which case you have a local min. So unfortunately, I, I used up some space. So if the derivative is 0, all right, and the second derivative is positive, then f has a local what at c? A local min. Okay, and if the derivative is zero and the second derivative is negative then f has a local max. Oops. And if the derivative is 0 and the second derivative is 0, what can you say? Aha, you have the right answer. No, you can't say anything. Okay. At least not without doing some more work. So this gives you an alternative way right, to test whether or not you have a max or a min. Right? So let's do a quick example of that. Let's just do an easy, easy example. All right, so let's look at x squared minus 2x plus 4. Okay, this is a nice parabola. Is it facing up or facing down? Up. Oh. 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 No? So we know it looks something like this. So whatever this vertex is, we know it's going to be a minimum. So we know that already. Okay, well let's just see how this works with the different methods. So if we take the derivative, we get 2x minus 2. Okay. If we set this equal to 0, then okay, 2x equals 2, and so x equals 1. Yeah. Okay. So this tells us that there's a critical point at 1. Okay. It's the only critical point, and we know that it's going to end up being, right, and how would we do this with the ID test? Well, we put down our little sign graph. We put our critical number, 1. Then we say, OK, fine. What happens to the derivative at less than 1? I'll say you put in minus 100. Of 0. Hmm? Of 0. Or 0. Or, or 0 works too, right? You put in a 0 and you get minus 2. OK, so you get a negative. And if you put in a positive number, like 100, then you get 200 minus 2. It's positive. OK, so it goes from negative to positive. Easy, right? It's a local minimum. It goes negative and positive. Fine. If we use the second derivative test, right, we say, okay, what's the second derivative? Well, the second derivative is 2. Always 2. Always 2. Right? And all we needed, right, is that, well, it needed to be positive. 2 is always positive. So if the derivative is 0, which it is at 1, and the second derivative is positive, 
which it is because it's always positive, then we know we have a local minimum. So plugging in any values and drawing a sign graph, this immediately tells you right, that it has to be a local minimum. In fact, this gives you an alternative proof that any quadratic with a positive leading coefficient has to be shaped so that it has a local minimum. Because in general, what if you have ax squared plus bx plus c, where a is greater than 0? Okay. Then the derivative is equal to 2ax plus b, which we know has some solution. Right? It's minus b over 2a. And the second derivative is 2a, which is positive since a is greater than 0. Okay? Which means right, you pick the one point where this is zero, and then the second derivative will be positive, so it always has a local minimum. And if a was negative, then this number would be negative, and so you'd have a local maximum. Okay? So this gives a very easy way of proving right, what a, you know, a quadratic is going to look like, okay, just based on the leading coefficient, right, whether it's going to be face up or face down. And it's not the only way to do that, or necessarily the easiest way, but it's very, very short. Right. And of course, you can also do this with you know, cubics, at least in, in certain cases. Okay. Well, yeah. If you plug um, the sub derivative in for zero, like two equals zero, because like, in order to do it, that like if you set the second derivative equal to zero, you know how it works. Oh, you're, okay, so you're thinking, how would I do a sine graph with a constant one? Yeah. Okay, so that's a good question. Okay, so it's kind of a trivial sine graph. You're supposed to put down all the places where it's zero, right? Well, there's no places where it's zero, so you don't put down anything. And then you just test any number, and of course any number, whatever you put in, you'll get a two, so you just write positive for the whole thing without any okay. reference to a number. Good question. I've never heard of that question before. It's a good one. Okay. Okay, so the second derivative test just doesn't get used a whole lot. Okay, usually you just use the ID test, draw your sine graph, find your local maximum. And there are a few cases that you can come up with where it's easier to plug in a number into the second derivative than it is to test the ranges on either side. But in almost all cases, you're going to use the ID test along with the first derivative test. Okay, so I just show this to you so you know it's out there. Okay. Now, a lot of you know that there's something called inflection uh, because you keep saying it over and over again, and I keep saying, well, we don't know what that is. Uh, so now let's make it so that we know what that is. Okay. And it's very simple. So, with the first derivative, when you switched from positive to negative or negative to positive, you get local maxes and local mins. With the second derivative, you can draw a sine graph, and if you see where it switches from positives to negatives or negatives to positive, that's where something would switch concavity from concave up to concave down or vice versa. And we just call those points of inflection. That's all it means. It means you have a switch from concave up to concave down or vice versa. So if uh, f prime uh, switches from positive to negative or negative to positive. And a point C. Right. Which, by the way, what, what will be the second derivative at, at point C? It should be zero, right? By which theorem? A theorem. I like I theorem better. The intermediate value theorem, right? Because what is the intermediate value theorem? It goes from negative to half to cross that one point. Exactly. At, at what point? It has to cross has to cross zero, right? It goes from negative to positive, 
had to cross zero. Went from positive to negative, has to cross zero, as long as it's a continuous function. Okay, but everything here is differentiable, continuous, no problem. Okay. So if the second derivative switches from positive to negative, or to positive, right, at point C, so at this point it was it was a zero, then F has a point of inflection. And of course, the second derivative being negative or positive just corresponds to concave up or concave down. Right? So if it switches from concave up to concave down, we call it a point of inflection. That's right? all it means. Okay? There's nothing, nothing fancy going on. Okay, so it's probably good if we did a nice big example where we graph something. No? Okay. Can we do one of those examples? We could, but I'm going to do a different one first. Okay. By the way, would there be any interest in me trying to screencast uh, one of these graphing problems? We mean that screen text. Well, for instance, I did this once before where I, I recorded myself at home um, working a problem in full, highlighting points that I thought were interesting and so forth. Just a little extra, you know, a little blur, you know, yeah. it'd be like five, yeah. ten minutes or whatever. Sure. Okay. Yeah, you could emphasize out of something with symmetry. With symmetry, yeah, because some of these things don't. And... Seems a little blurry. Okay, okay. Yeah. So, uh, okay, so um, now that we're at the end, I want to amend this sentence a little bit to correspond to what we will actually do, right? This, this gives a list of all the things, all the possible things that we've done so far, okay? But one of the things that's not up here and what we use very commonly are these sign graphs, okay? And so I want to add that to the sentence so that... Remember. Okay, it's a sign. Okay, and, and I also want to put parentheses around here and say, in a lot of cases, you can just forget that part of the sentence. Okay? Like I said, anything you're doing with the second derivative test, there's a very good chance you could already be doing it with the ID test, right, or the first derivative. So you might just say, Dai said first a critical test, then a cavity. <gasps> it's a sign! Okay. So it's, it's got some drama to it that helps you remember it. Okay. But remember there is a second derivative test. All right, so I think I put up this problem last week, but we didn't get to graph it. x squared over x minus 2 times x minus 6. By the way, if you're practicing ahead of time, before the final, these rational functions are good ones to practice. Uh, I haven't written up the final. I'm not telling you there'll be a rational function on there. But there will be. And the reason is because other than, well, sometimes symmetry you lose, but you can put a lot of the stuff in here. You're going to get your vertical asymptotes. You're going to get your horizontal asymptotes. Right? All the fun stuff's going to work out. And I get to test whether or not you know how to use the quotient rule. OK, so let's go through it. OK, we start at the beginning. We're looking for the domain. What's the domain of this function? I know we've done this already, but it, it doesn't hurt, I think, to do this again. So what's the domain here? Two and six. Two and six? Is that the domain? All reals oh. except All reals except two and six. Okay, of course I know what you mean when you say two yes. and six. I throw those out, okay? But we'll be precise, okay? Because that's how you are understood. And all real numbers except for two and six. Good. So this already suggests later on that what might we have at two and six? What kind? 
Horizontal? Oh, vertical, right? Which way are the horizontal ones? Those are, yeah. those are these ones, right? Those is x goes to infinity and minus infinity. So the ones at points, those are the verticals. Okay, so we'll keep that at the back of our head. Next comes the intercepts. Okay, so the x-intercept okay, is where you set y equal to 0. Okay, so that means the whole function is equal to 0. And so if f of x equals 0, well, it's a fraction. When does a fraction equal to 0? When the numerator is 0. All right? When's the numerator 0? When x is 0. Okay, now automatically, every single time you find the x-intercepts and x equals 0 is one of them, you don't have to check the y-intercepts. You already got it. Right? The y-intercepts is when you set x equal to 0. So you already know. Okay, so that's the only intercept. It's right at the origin. So let's, well, let's, see. let's put a picture over here. We know we have a point at 0, 0. That's the intercept. And, well, we don't know what exactly is going on at 2 and 6, but we know something funky is going to go on at 2 and 6. So, 3, 4, 5, 6. Okay, so we'll just put those numbers up there to remind us something funny should be happening there. Yes, sir? Yeah. If we were going to go through and find the y-intercepts, well, how would you find it? Because the x-intercepts is where f of x is 0. Mm -hmm. Where would the y-intercept So, the x-intercept is where y is 0. The y-intercept is where oh, x is 0. X is zero right? So you would just plug 0 into the function. Okay. So next comes symmetry. Now on the top, you have a nice right, even function. But on the bottom, uh-oh, an odd plus an even. Remember, constants are always even functions. And what happens when you start mixing odds and even when, with add and, or subtract? You just you lose everything, right? Okay, so the odds are very bad here in the symmetry. Okay. Fine, let's move on to asymptotes. So, well, we already know there's going to be a problem at 2 and 6, right, of some sort. So why don't we take care of those first? Let's look at the vertical asymptotes. What's happening as x goes to, say, 2, right, to our function? Right, what's the limit as x goes to 2 of x squared over x minus 2 times x minus 6? Does not exist. That's the correct answer. Yeah, why is it the correct answer? Why isn't it infinity? You can't go over zero. You can't divide by zero. Why would a limit... Remember, I don't treat infinite limits as do not exist, right? If a limit is infinity, I, I call it infinity. Okay, I don't say it doesn't exist. So why would, in, in all of we've seen, why would a limit not exist? Because both sides are equal. Because the one-sided limits aren't the same. Right? Remember, a, a two-sided limit means you have two one-sided limits, which are the same. Okay. So what happens as I approach two from, say, the left? Well, let's see. Up here, that's just going to four doesn't matter which side I'm coming from. No problem up there. Okay, It's just some positive number. Now on the bottom, though, as I approach 2 from the left, say I'm something a little smaller than 2, what, what kind of number is this? All right? Some small negative number. And this one over here? Negative also, right? Some negative number. So I have a negative times a negative. It's a positive. Okay, positive over positive. Okay, so it's going to be a positive number, and it's... As this number gets closer and closer to zero, the whole bottom is getting closer and closer to zero, so this fraction should be going up to infinity. 
What if I approach it from the right? So now I have some numbers slightly bigger than 2. So what's happening to this difference? It's going to be, what do you think, Shannon? bigger than 2, right, because I'm coming from the right, and I subtract 2, what kind of number do I get? Positive number, right? So that was positive, that's positive, and this is still negative, right, because you have some numbers real close to 2, minus 6 is negative. So now the whole number is going to be negative, so it's going to be going down to negative infinity. Which means that the two-sided limit does not exist, okay, only the one-sided limit. Okay, but we do know we get a vertical asymptote. And for the exact same reasons, just with the number 2 replaced with the number 6, well, I put comma 6 to denote either one of these. It works the exact same way around 6. Okay, do you have a number smaller than 6? No, wait, is this right? No, there must be something a little wrong here. Somebody's got to stop. Somebody's got to stop. It's the same thing, right? It's the same argument, right? If I put it in, I just replace 2 and 6, nothing changed, right? Come on, somebody's got to stop. 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 Why? Why should I stop? It's the same argument. Stop. <laughs> What's the um, difference? Because when you... When you're around six, oops, whatever's around six minus two is going to be positive. Uh huh. Exactly right. So I can't do this. I really have to write something else down. You got to be careful. Don't just start reusing arguments without thinking. Okay. If I put in something slightly below six. And this becomes negative. But slightly below is definitely bigger than 2. So that's positive. So I get positive times negative is negative. Now it's positive. So the whole thing is negative. So this goes to negative infinity. And if I come from the other side of 6, then, well, now everything's positive. So I get positive infinity. So I do get an asymptote at 6 on both sides. Okay, now let's see what happens. As I go from the left, it goes to infinity. So let me just mark this up so we can remember. Okay, and I'm from the right side, it's supposed to go down to minus infinity. And over here on 6, it should be going to minus infinity. And then up here, it should be going up to positive infinity. Okay. So we just mark these down so we... So even if the limit does not exist, there's some asymptote? Absolutely, right? It, it, it's just like with horizontal asymptotes. There's a left and a right side to every asymptote. Okay, you have a left horizontal asymptote, a right horizontal asymptote. The left vertical asymptote, the right vertical asymptote. And they, one of them can exist, and one of them they have, you might not even have a vertical asymptote from one side. But will there ever be a vertical asymptote at a point other than where the origin of function doesn't exist? Or yes. Okay. Yes. And here's a quick example. I think I may have already given you this one. It's kind of a pathological example, you might say. Right? But it does have a vertical asymptote coming from the left. Right? It looks like that. Right? But at 0, it actually comes up and hits the value 1. Yeah, OK. Okay, so we have a little bit in there, so let's do the horizontal asymptote. So for the horizontal asymptotes, what are we looking at? Exactly. Limit as x approaches infinity, right, and the limit 
as x approaches minus infinity. And to do that, let me make a quick observation over here. Might help this. Okay, I can expand this, no problem. x squared minus 8x plus 12. Right? Why do I do that? Well, sometimes it's easier to work with a situation like this than it is a situation like this. How is it going to be easier? Well, if we evaluate the limit as x, say, goes to infinity, well, you go infinity over infinity. Is it 1? Well, let's see. Why, is it, why would it be 1? Well, for instance, we could use what? Lopitau's rule. Lopitau's rule. Right? We could also factor it, by the way. Let's say we use Lopitau's rule. Then you're going to get 2x over 2x minus 8, which is, again, going to infinity over infinity. So you use Lopitau's rule again, and you get 2 over 2, which is 1. Or you write from the beginning, factor out an x squared. Okay, well, there's not much to factor out on top. It's just x squared. Okay, and on the bottom, you'd get x squared times 1 minus 8 over x plus 12 over x squared. Everything with an over x will go away as x goes to infinity. And so you'd be left with a 1, right? Because the x squareds will cancel either way. And you'll notice nowhere in there did we actually need to use that we had plus or minus infinity. Okay, just that it was some infinity. So in either case, the limit will be 1. So either by factoring or using Lopitau's rule. OK, so now let's draw this horizontal asymptote. OK, so there's a left and a right one, and they're both 1. So I'll put in 1 here. So we know the graph is somehow going to approach that on either side. OK, what's next? Ah, we do the ID test. Okay. Now, before I do the ID test, because I know I'm eventually going to draw a sign graph down, so let me just start drawing some sign graphs, some little patterns for it. You know, eventually we're going to want all three of these. Okay, and F we can actually already do. Okay, so when you want to do F, you just look for either where it's zero or it's not defined. Okay, like when x equals two or x equals six. Okay, so we get zero, two, and six. So those are interesting points, and we can check where this thing is going to be positive or negative. Okay, so let's see, we'll put in something really negative in there. Okay, if you put in something really negative, well, the top is still positive. Okay, this will be negative, this will be negative. So you get a positive on the bottom, so the whole thing will be positive. Then we say, okay, zero came from x squared, which is an even degree. So it's not going to switch signs. Two came from something with odd degree, so it will switch signs. And six came from something with odd degree, so it will switch signs. Okay, so we already know, right? This whole quadrant down here is not going to be used, right? This whole quadrant is not going to be used. Why? Well, before you get to zero, this function is always positive. Right? So this whole region, we're not going to have to worry about. Okay, so that's nice. So it's somehow going to have to live around here. Okay, so, but now we want to know the first derivative, right? So let's take a derivative. Okay, so here comes the fun. Okay, so again, if we read it in this form, it might be easier to do the derivative. Right? So we want to use the product rule. But when we do the denominator of the quotient rule, we can leave it in this form. So that'll be easier. So let's see, uh, low d high, so 
2x uh, times x squared, or actually we can leave it in that top form if we like, minus high and low. So the derivative of the low is 2x minus 8. And then we multiply by x squared. So x squared times 2x minus 8 divided by, now we square the bottom, x minus 2 squared, x minus 6 squared. Okay, so let's see. Maybe it actually would be better to write it x squared minus 8x plus 12. Yeah, I think we'll, it'll, we're going to have to expand it anyway. Okay, so we're, now we just do some algebra. Just to simplify things. Okay, so let's see here. Uh, we got a 2x cubed. By the way, if you're thinking, did we already do this? Yeah, we did that last week, but algebra practice is good. Okay, let's see. Minus 16x squared, uh, minus 24x, minus 2x cubed, plus 8x squared. over x minus 2 squared times x minus 6 squared. And ah, that's right, the 2x cubes cancel. And then we have minus 16x squared plus 8x squared, so that's minus 8x squared minus 20x. And over x minus 2 squared, x minus 6 squared. And if we are really ambitious, we notice we can factor out a minus 8x. So you get minus 8x times x minus 3 over x minus 2 squared, x minus 6 squared. Okay, so there's our derivative. And it's as simplified as we can get. Okay, so, yeah? No, I didn't mess up. What did I do? Where did I mess up? Oh, is it plus 12? Ah, oh, force duties. Okay, so that means that this became a plus 24x, and so this was a plus 24x, and so that's a plus 3. Uh, no, 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 because... Actually, it was right the way I had it. No, it wasn't. If I pull that up, that becomes a minus 3. Actually, it was right. <laughs> My mistake! Here's the beauty. I told you, this is what Kepler did. If you make even numbers of mistakes, they cancel out. <laughs> See, I made one sign error there and one sign error there, and so I was actually had the right answer. And to always make them in pairs, that's the key. Okay, okay fine. So let's see, we need to figure out where this thing is zero. Okay, well that's, that's easy, right? Where the numerator is zero. You get zero and three. 0 and 3. And, well, 2 and 6, where the derivative is not defined, are they critical numbers? Yes. Remember, critical numbers is either where the derivative was 0 or the derivative is not defined and in the domain. they were in the domain. Are 2 and 6 in the domain of the function? Yeah. yeah. Oh. Remember that. We threw 2 and 6 out. <laughs> Okay, so they're not really critical numbers. So we know they're, we're not going to have local max or local mins there. But, but, they're still important points. Okay, you can still have sign changes, and I think it's still a good idea to plot them in your sign graph. Okay. All right, so let's, let's do it. Put in a really big negative number, then this becomes positive. That's negative, and then the bottom is always positive because you have squares. So you just get positive times negative is negative. Okay? And now zero comes from a, a first degree term, so it's going to switch sides. And two comes from a square, so it's not going to switch sides. And three comes from a first degree term, so it's going to switch sides. And six comes from a square, so it's not going to switch sides. All right, 
So we've looked for the sign changes, minus to positive, and positive to negative. So that's going to be a local, we'll see, it goes minus to positive, down to so it's a minimum. Okay, and this is going to give you a local max. Right, because it goes positive to negative. Okay, so let's see, let's fill those in. Uh, so f of 0 is, well, it's 0, right? So that's your local minimum. Okay, so that's nice. So this means this right here is a local minimum. And then the other place where you get a, a local something is 3. And when you plug in a 3, let's see. You get minus 1, I'm sorry, 3, you get 1 times minus 3 is minus 3, and 9 divided by minus 3 is minus 3, and that's your local max. Okay, so we plug that in, 3 comma minus 3. You get 1, 2, 3. Okay, and that is a local max. And you should already have a pretty good feeling what's happening around here. Remember, around these asymptotes, right, you were going down on both sides. So this probably looks like some sort of parabolic shape. Just going down, and there's the max. Okay, but we'll check, make sure there's nothing funny going on with concavity. Okay, so to get concavity, right, which is the next step, we need to take the second derivative. write our first derivative up here again. So minus 8x, x minus 3 over x minus 2 squared times x minus 6 squared. Okay, so we're going to have some fun now. We're going to have some fun. Okay, so I'm going to erase, erase this stuff. Just remember our, our original function here is uh, Squared over x minus two times x minus six. Okay, so f double prime equals. All right, low d high. All right, I won't expand it yet. I'm afraid to, frankly. It times the derivative of the top. Okay, now the top is minus eight x squared plus 24x. Right? So that's easier to take the derivative of. You get uh, minus 16x plus 24. Okay. Uh, minus, now you do the top. Minus, uh, you get plus x, x minus 3, times the derivative of the bottom. Okay, so let's see. It's going to be product rule. Product, better use parentheses. Okay, so if we hold the first term, we get x minus 2 squared times the derivative of the second term, right? Well, that's going to be 2 times x minus 6. 2 x minus 6 plus, well, now I just swap the rules. Okay, I hold that fixed, I take the derivative, I get 2 times x minus 2. 2 x minus 2 times x minus 6. And all of this over x minus 2 to the fourth, x minus 6 to the fourth. Holy guacamole. All right, well, uh, we better do some factoring before we get too lost. Now, this, right, is minus 8 times x minus 6. Okay, so uh, I have an x minus 2, an x minus 2, and an x minus 2. So I can pull an x minus 2 out. Uh, let's see, a coefficient. I have a minus 8, I have an 8, 
And so if I turn that into a minus, minus 8, then uh, I can pull out a minus 8. So the minus 8, I call it an x minus 2. I have an x minus 6, and an x minus 6, and an x minus 6. So I can pull out an x minus 6. And I have an x minus 3 and an x minus 3. Yeah. You can put an x minus 6 squared, can you? Uh, I don't have an x minus 6 squared in that term. Oh, okay. Just three terms. Just that one, yeah. That one place. Okay, so now what am I left with after I factor all that out? Uh, yeah, because I didn't have any x's in this term I can factor. So, I have one x minus 2 left. I have an x minus 6 left. I factored all that out. That's nice. Okay, and then we had minus, I factor out in minus 8, the x is still there. Uh, I still have a 2 from each of these that I can put up there. Uh, the x minus 3 left, I have an x minus 2. I got rid of the x minus 6, so the 2's already pulled out. I got rid of the x minus 2, and I'm just left with a uh, x minus 6. It's like that scab on me. Don't pick it. Okay, now. Yeah, if you wanted to, right? What's that? You could if you wanted to, right? You get rid of the x minus. You get rid of one of the x minus two and one next. Oh, okay, this is true. Yeah, we can start canceling. You're right about that. Yeah, we can cancel those. I don't want to expand the bottom, but yeah, you're right. We can cancel. Just pick it. Okay, so this will become a three. Okay, now, on the inside, there's probably a good fun we can have. So we get minus 8, x minus 3. And now on the inside, all right, this will be, well, we've done that before. That's x squared minus 8x plus 12. And then in here, okay, this is 2x minus 8. And then we're multiplying by minus 2. So it becomes uh, minus 4x squared and then plus 16x. And then on the bottom we have our x minus 2 cubed and x minus 6 cubed. Okay, and so we head back to the left to do our last simplification. So, I'm head over here. So equals, all right, top will leave minus 8 times x minus 3. And now, let's see, we have an x squared and a minus 4x squared, so it's minus 3x squared. A minus 8x and a plus 16, so it's plus 8x. And a plus 12. Now, what can we almost 100% guarantee at this point? Just almost 100% we can guarantee. Is it going to be a point of inflection at zero? Well, that's a very clever thought, but I was thinking something more simplistic. We can guarantee that we made a mistake somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you do this much algebra, you probably made a mistake somewhere. Okay, that's, that's all I'm going to get at. <laughs> okay, but for the sake of argument, let's say we've done this correctly. What are we supposed to do once we get here? Because we probably forgot where we were going. All right, okay, remember we were computing the second derivative. What? <laughs> we were computing the second derivative, right, so that we could do the sign graph. So we set it equal to zero. Now, that's not so bad, okay? Because, well, look. 
If the top is equal to zero, then x is, well, it could be a three, or, well, it has to solve this, this quadratic equation. Assuming we didn't horribly mess up this calculation, which we certainly did. And I'm sure when we go back and watch this on the video, we're going to find all the mistakes. But that's okay. okay. We just work in good faith. Okay, so let's see. The quadratic formula tells me, let's see, uh, x equals minus 8 plus or minus the square root, 64 minus, minus is plus 4 times 3 times 12 is 144 over minus 6. Okay, which we can simplify a little bit. Um, that's going to be 208 under the radical over 6. Okay, so let's see. Uh, 208, well, I can't say too much about it. It's, what, 4 times 52? Yeah. So that becomes 2 root 52 over 6, and then you can at least cancel a little bit, you get minus 4 plus root 52 over 3. Plus minus. Oh, that should be minus. Okay. So, up to the mistakes that we made, we know what these are roughly, okay? So, fifth, root 52 is a little bigger than, than what? Than 7. Okay, so minus 4 plus 7 would be 3 divided by minus 3 is minus 1. So it's a little bigger than minus 1. Hmm? And if you do minus 4 minus 7, you get minus 11. Okay, it's a little bigger than actually minus 11. Uh, or a little smaller if you like, more negative. Okay, divided by minus 3 is going to be almost minus 4. Right? Because minus 12 divided by minus, I mean, not minus 4, positive. 4, positive 4. Okay, so around minus 1 and 4. Okay, and then we had uh, 3. So minus 1, 3, and 4. Okay, we plug in our sign graph. Okay, so let's see. If we put in uh, something really, really negative, okay, that becomes negative. That's negative, so you get a positive. Now, this term is the dominant term. So as x gets really, really, really big in the negative, that goes to positive, but times minus 3 goes negative. So this whole term will become negative. Okay, so you get negative uh, times negative is positive, times negative is negative on top. And on the bottom, you get negative and negative, which is positive. Okay, so it was negative over positive is negative. And now the minus 1... Let's see, let's put in zero. That's probably the easiest way to do it. So when you plug in zero, you get negative, negative, positive. So that's going to be positive. And you get negative, negative, which is positive. Which is? Okay, now the three, in this term, which is linear, so it's going to switch sides. And the four, right, that also came from here. And since it switched sides, it, I'm sorry, where did I get? Oh, that's right. These are not the exact numbers, right? Remember, it's actually around minus 1. Okay, but in any case, uh, it's got to switch signs there, too, for the same reason minus 1 did. Okay. So we now know that we're going to get inflection points around minus 1 and around 4. Okay, without being too specific. We could actually write down these specific numbers. Okay, but it's around there. Okay, so uh, at minus 1, we're going to get 1, and at 4. Oh, and we forgot one. Yeah, there are 3. We forgot one, 3, right? Goes from positive to negative. Okay, so this is actually a point of inflection at 3. Remember we said we thought it might be just a nice parabolic curve? It actually switches inflection on the other side of that curve, so that's kind of weird. Okay. So let's see, at minus 1, and then around uh, we are going to get something. Okay, so then we just need to quickly figure out what these values are going to be. Okay, and we'll just do this very roughly since we're almost out of time. 
uh, at minus 1, when you put that into your original function, you get uh, 1 and then minus 1 and minus 5. I'm sorry, minus 1, minus 6, minus 7, minus 1, minus 2 is minus 3. So minus 3 times minus 7 is 21. So 1 over 21 is like 1 21st. So it's very small. Okay, so about that. And then we already know where it is at 3, and around 4, 4 if we put it in, we get 2 and minus 2, so that's minus 4, and 4 squared is 16, so 16 divided by minus 4 is minus 4, so. Okay, so somewhere around there. We'll get another change in concavity. Okay. So we get points of inflection in a lot of places. Point of inflection, point of inflection, and another point of inflection. Okay, and now as class ends, we, we, we graph it, right? We got everything we need. Okay, so let's recall. On the left side, we know we had a horizontal asymptote. Right? And uh, we know it's got it's going to be where? What do we got? It's going up towards it. Okay. Can it can it cross the horizontal asymptote? Why not? Well, remember we said you can cross asymptotes. Okay, a lot of people think you can't cross them. You can cross asymptotes. Right? You can cross them infinitely many times. But let's say we did cross the asymptote. If we crossed it, so it's going up, then it would have to turn around and go back down towards it. Now if you went up, and then down you get a local maximum. But there are no local maximums over here. There's just this little local minimum at zero. Okay? So it's got to just go up to it. You can't cross it. Because if it did, it'd have to have another min or max. Okay, now what's the concavity? Right? Well, it's going to be negative most of the way, except between, well, between zero and, and negative one, the concavity is actually positive. So it actually is kind of going up, right? Concave up like a cup, but then at minus one, or not really at minus one, near minus one, okay? But we'll use minus one as a stand-in, okay? It's got to change concavity and go down and then head up towards the asymptote, okay? Now it has to stay up on the other side of zero as far as concavity. But what's happening to the actual graph? Well, between 0 and 2, let's see, it's uh, actually going up. Okay, and how far does it go up? It goes up right to the asymptote. Okay, so it's got to go up. And what's the concavity? The concavity is positive. So it's going to look like that. That would be a fun roller coaster. Okay, now let's see, on the other side of the asymptote, we know it's coming from here, okay? And it's got to go up and it's got to hit the local max. And between two and three, it's positive concavity. Okay. So it's looking like, like what? Well, the negative concavity looks like that. It's positive concavity. It's got to look like that, okay? It's got to be heading down in that sort of direction. At 3, it's going to change concavity. It's got to become negative, right? And that's also where it has a local max. And it's going to turn around. Okay, so it actually should almost lighten up a little bit here. It's going to turn around, but then, so it's negative concavity until it gets to this point around 4, where it's got to again switch concavity. and head down towards infinity, but always with a, a concave up sort of slope, which is difficult to draw. Okay. And then on the other side of 6, well, it's going to have positive concavity. Okay. And again, it has a horizontal asymptote. Can it cross that horizontal asymptote? Well, if it did, it would have to turn around and come back, and there would be another local minimum. So it can't cross the asymptote. So it's got to look like this on the other side. Okay. We'll 
get rid of this garbage. Strange looking graph. Yeah, very strange looking graph. So there's there's something really interesting with this sort of graph. One is it well, it's just inherently quite interesting. I mean, it looks really weird. And two, without using these sort of tools and this nice framework, how would you have come up with this? If you started plotting points, how would you? Have, how many points would you have had to plot to get this? I mean, it'd be <laughs> I mean, and, and to get the nuance, right? Where are all the minimums and maximums? Where it's changing the, the concavity? You couldn't do it. Right? You'd spend way more time, and you wouldn't be, you know, very sure of yourself. So this takes a lot of practice, but one nice thing, this tests everything that you've done pretty much the whole semester. I mean, what is it involved in this? So this is the perfect test question to study. Like, is it going to be like this?